All right, let's get started for today. A couple of announcements. Um, tonight we'll send out an email with links to a few surveys. We'd love to get your feedback on a few things. The first one is not just feedback, we actually really, really need it. We need you to fill out in a form your edX username and your Gradescope corresponding email address so we can consolidate both of your sources of grades. Second thing will be a mid-semester survey. It'll be pretty short. I'll be focused on the things that we're doing a little different this semester to get your feedback on how those are working. So almost all of it will be about how we have two types of discussion sections now, the discussion section and the exam practice session. And we'll have a bunch of questions about that to see how that's going, what we might want to change, maybe this semester, but definitely for uh, future semesters. And also there's a survey for project four, which is a new project, which we'd like to get your feedback on. In terms of what's going on, um, things that are due for you, homework seven, is due tonight, so exceptionally your homework is due on Tuesday this week because of spring break. Um, homework 8 will go out very soon and will be due next week Monday. And then project 5, Ghostbusters, of which we'll see a few previews in this lecture, will go out soon and will be due next week Friday at 5. Any questions about logistics? All right, it's been a full week break, so let's do a quick probability recap and then get started on HMMs. So just as a reminder, what was conditional probability? The conditional probability for X given Y is defined as the probability of the joint divided by the marginal of just Y. You can rearrange this to get the next expression, which we call the product rule, but it's just a rearrangement of the definition of conditional probability. The product rule can be generalized to express a distribution over any number of random variables as a product of a marginal and conditionals. Um, we actually use this to arrive at an expression for distributions represented by business by simplifying some things behind the conditioning bar. Two random variables x and y are independent if and only if for all values they can take on small x and small y. The joint probability of x and y is equal to the product of the marginals of just x and y. We also realized that complete independence was a very strong assumption that rarely is an assumption we're able to work with in any meaningful way. So we started looking at conditional independence. And so X and Y are conditional independent given some third random variable Z, even only if for all values X, Y, and Z can take on. We have that the conditional of X and Y given Z is the same as the product of the conditional for X given Z times the conditional for y given z. And this is our notation for conditional independence, x conditional independent of y given z. Note that this is symmetric in x and y. You might as well write y orthogonal bars, x vertical bar z. Okay, so hidden market models, the topic of today's lecture and Thursday's lecture. What they are for is reasoning over time or space. Whenever we want to reason over a sequence of observations. This has applications in speech recognition where you're trying to recognize what's being said. So you get in a sequence of sound signals and over time you want to process the signals as they come in and turn them into a reasonable sequence of words, for example. Robot localization, where a robot might be placed in a room. It might have some sensors, maybe a laser that can send out beams, measure how long it takes for that beam to get back to it. So let's assume it has a very precise clock. So it measures, took this long for the laser beam to hit the wall, come back to me, multiply this by the speed of light. And now you know twice the distance to that wall. Um, that's a standard way of localizing, for, for a robot to localize itself. A robot might move and so over time it'll get new measurements and you wanna somehow accumulate those measurements into a unified representation of where the robot might be right now. User attention is another example. Maybe you build a website, you want to monitor where people might be looking. You might have a model over 
where they might look as a function of where they were looking before. You might have some measurements, maybe eye tracking through their webcam. And based on these measurements and a model of how their eyes might move, you might be able to recover at least a distribution over where they might be looking at any given time. Medical monitoring is another one where maybe somebody's in the ICU, um, you have a bunch of measurement devices hooked up to them, and you want to track over time, accumulating all the evidence you get to currently get the best estimate of what their health status is. To work these kind of problems, we'll need to introduce a concept of time or space into our models. We actually already have most of the machinery. Um, we'll actually heavily rely on what we saw for base nets. So, Let's look at Markov models first. So we got rid of the hidden, uh, just Markov models. And we'll look at the value of x, which is, for example, a state variable at a given time. Um, this could be the same kind of state variable we saw when we were covering MDPs. So we have some state evolving over time. We'll have in a Markov model two distributions that are specified, a initial state distribution, px1, telling us what we think x1 might be, um, but probabilistically, because we might not be sure what it exactly is. And then we have a conditional distribution for the state at time t, given the state at time t minus 1. Note that this distribution here applies to x2, x3, x4, and so forth. So rather than, as in a standard basement, where we have a conditional distribution that's specific to each node, in a Markov model, we have one distribution for the first node and then another conditional distribution that is applicable to all other nodes in the model. Okay, so these are called transition probabilities, still just like we had them in MDPs, often also called dynamics, and to specify how the state will evolve over time. The stationarity assumption is the assumption that this distribution here applies to all times t from 2 onwards, so the dynamics is the same at time t as it is at some other time t prime. Same as the MDP transition model, but no action. So you can think of it as an, an MDP where the action space is just one action to choose from. So it doesn't matter what you choose because there's only one option. Let's look at the independence assumptions we're making here. So the basic conditional independence assumption made in this model is that the past is independent of the future given the present. So once you get to observe this variable over here in the middle, observing anything about the past doesn't give you any new information about the future. It's easy to see here that middle variable deseparates all variables in the future from all variables in the past. The same is true the other way around. Once you know that middle variable, knowing anything about the future variables does not give you any new information about the past variables. This is called the Markov property here that whenever you're interested in the distribution for a variable at the next time, all that matters is the variable at the current time, further in the past, will not influence your distribution. Yes? Past and future independent given. Thanks for correcting that typo. So instead of off, this should say given. Thank you. So what we have here is effectively just a base net that we can grow as time passes or as we expand our reasoning over space. So let's look at an example. Simple example, the state can be either rain or sun. Um, time will correspond to days here. So the first day in our Markov chain is Monday, happens to be sunny, next day is Tuesday, happens to be sunny, next day is Wednesday, happens to be rainy, and so forth, for a specific instantiation of these variables. The initial distribution in this model here is that we're 100% certain it's sunny on the first day. The conditional distribution for the next state, given the current state, is given by this table over here. What we see is that when it's sunny, it's likely to be sunny again. When it's rainy, it's likely to be rainy again. But it's possible that actually the weather changes from day to day. Now, 
This is what we've seen so far in business. Because we only have one conditional probability table to deal with in Markov models, um, and we often want to look at it in a little more detail, there are a few different ways of drawing out this thing over here. One way to draw it out is as follows. Looks like a finite state machine effectively, but with probabilities on the transition edges. And so it's saying that if the current state is rain, a 0 0.7 chance it'll stay there, 0 0.3 chance it'll transition to sun. This here is not anything like a basinet. This is just a way to graphically represent a conditional probability table. The basinet that corresponds to our Markov chain is over here. Another way to represent it is this trellis diagram over here where we effectively time slice what we had in the finite state machine representation. We have now a variable for a node for sun at time t, a node for rain at time t, but then also a node for each value at time t plus 1. And so we now explicitly see that we transition from t to t plus 1 the way it's drawn over here. But again, this here is not a base net. It's just a representation of the conditional probability table that's shown over here. Okay, now let's take a look at what we can do computationally. Our initial distribution was 100% chance for sun. And we could ask ourselves the question, at the next time step, what is the distribution over sun versus rain? Well, we can actually read this off from here, right? We know that it's 100% chance sun at the beginning. That means we have a 0 0.9 probability of sun at the next time and a 0 0.1 probability of rain at the next time. In general, what the calculation looks like is as follows. The probability of having sun at time two is a sum over all possible states you could be in at time one. So there are two possible states, sun or rain. Each has some probability. And then, weighted by the probability of being in that state, you then multiply in the probability of transitioning into sun given that state. And so this is what it looks like over here. Any questions about this? This is essentially our first algorithm we're covering today. Okay, so that is what we call the mini forward algorithm if we were to repeat this for future time steps. So if we want to ask ourselves the question, what's the distribution over the state at some future time t? We can start with what we know for time one. Then we can use this recursive update equation that we just applied to go from time one to time two to go from any time t minus 1 to the next time t. And the equation looks like this. We sum over all possible states at time t minus 1, the joint distribution between t minus 1 and t. This is always true. And then we'll use what we have available to us, which is the conditional distribution for xt given xt minus 1. And we assume we already have the distribution for xt minus 1. OK. That's the mini forward algorithm. We'll see extensions of this later. This is the version that we have for Markov models. Now let's see what happens if we run this algorithm for a while. So our initial distribution was 100% chance sun, 0% chance rain. We do one step in the mini forward algorithm. We end up with 0 0.9, 0 0.1. We now apply that update again get 0 0.84, 0 0.16, and we can keep applying this. And as we keep going, we see that this actually converges to 0 0.75, 0 0.25. I didn't prove this here, but if you were to do this calculation, you'll see that you get closer and closer to those numbers as you go along. Now let's start from a different initial distribution. Let's say initially we observed it was rainy, we start from that. We can do a similar calculation, apply the mini forward algorithm, see what we get at time two, see what we get at time three, keep going, and it turns out it ends up also with 0 0.75, 0 0.25, exactly the same distribution as t goes to infinity. Turns out if you start from yet another initial distribution, any initial distribution, p, 1 minus p, you work through the same calculation, you end up with 0 0.75, 0 0.25. So this is an interesting phenomenon here, which is saying that independent of what you had initially, after you go along for long enough, you'll always end up, for this particular Markov model, 
with the 0 0.75, 0 0.25 distribution. This is called the stationary distribution. It's the distribution you reach after going on for long enough. It also means that whatever was true at the beginning here, that information essentially gets erased. There's nothing at the end that still refers back to where it came from. You essentially lost that. Just the way, because of the way this Markov model behaves. So let's look at some examples, um, slightly bigger scenario. So this is our Ghostbuster scenario again. This time the ghost is not stationary. The ghost moves around, in this case randomly. Let's first track it down a little bit. So let's see where it is. Um, maybe it's here. Okay, seems like it's roughly over there. Now, let's assume this here will be the initial distribution for our Markov model. So that's what we start from at time t equals one. Then we'll let time elapse. Underneath, there will be a mini forward algorithm update to go from time t to t plus one. And the distribution that we see will change accordingly. So it diffused a little bit away from that corner because the ghost moves at random. We don't know exactly where it's going. So the 0 0.99 is not as concentrated anymore in a single spot. And then we can keep going. As time passes, we see how this probability distribution spreads out over this grid, reflecting the fact that the ghost is moving randomly. If we do this long enough, we'll actually see that this becomes a uniform distribution again and we lost all information about where the ghost might be. Now let's look at another example. In this new example, the ghost is not moving just at random. The ghost is moving in a circular motion, but with a little bit of noise. So we again have our initial situation here. Let's narrow it down a little bit where the ghost might be. Okay. So we start with this distribution over here. That's our initial distribution. Now we'll stop measuring and we'll just let time elapse. The ghost will go through a circular motion. So if it really were here, it'll kind of move around this way, but there will be some noise that'll make it veer off that path to some extent. And so let's see how this distribution evolves. So this distribution for time one, distribution for time two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. And you see that the probability mass again spreads out over the entire grid in this case because there is randomness in the motion and over time you completely lose track over where the ghost might be. Of course, ideally you'd measure again if you have the ability to do so and you might narrow it down again where the ghost is. But in a Markov model, you don't get to measure, you just get to let dynamics evolve. Let's look at the last example. Um, this one is qualitatively different. So here, we have a dynamics model that acts like a vortex, where ghosts are drawn into the middle, but there is some randomness to it. So let's see what happens when we don't even observe anything to start out with and use this as our initial distribution and let the dynamics play out. I want to think about what you expect to happen here. So, as time passes, we see there is less and less probability weight in the outer regions and more and more probability mass at the center here. This is the center of the vortex. The vortex kind of spins between these two little grid squares here, but really spirals into it from everywhere. And so, what we see here is that some reverse effect happened where rather than losing track of the ghosts because we don't have measurements and the dynamics is evolving, we actually find out where the ghost is most likely because the dynamics converges onto just two states here. So this can, this dynamics in general will result in you losing track of where things are and having a more diffuse distribution, but it doesn't have to be the case. You can design distributions where things actually converge even without observations, 
to a very small set of squares or even just one square. Any questions about these examples? Yes? If there were no noise, um, so there are three examples here, right? The first example is one where the ghosts uniformly move at random. If there's no noise, I guess the best approximation of that would be that the ghosts don't move, in which case the distribution would just stay the same. In the second case, where the ghosts move in a circle, if there were no noise and you have some initial distribution of where the ghost might be, you'll see that distribution spin around in this grid in a deterministic way. Um, then in the last scenario here, if there is no noise, you'll get almost the same behavior as you're seeing here. It'll just converge even more quickly to the center two squares. And the second one, if there was no noise, what would happen is you get a cyclic pattern over what the probabilities are for each of the grid squares, and so there would be no stationary distribution. You're right. So to have a stationary distribution, you need, well, informally you need some kind of noise. More formally, you need a certain connectivity pattern between your states. And if you have no noise at all, you go around in circles, that's an exception to the kind of connectivity pattern you need to get a stationary distribution. So what we saw here in these examples is that for most Markov chains, the influence of the initial distribution gets less and less over time. But keep in mind, there are exceptions. It depends on your dynamics. And so as long as a certain set of assumptions is satisfied, which you can think of as assuming there's a little bit of noise everywhere, that's enough. But it's actually, you don't need that. You need a weaker condition is sufficient. But as long as there's a little bit of noise everywhere, you will end up with a stationary distribution that is independent of the initial distribution. The stationary distribution satisfies this equation over here. So rather than doing this long computation of applying the mini forward algorithm steps multiple times until you finally see what it might be converging to, you can write out the equation that characterizes convergence. You can say at convergence, which is at time t equals infinity, the distribution I got at time t equals infinity plus one has to be the same as what I had at time t equals infinity. Written out, this says that if I do the mini forward update from time t equals infinity to time infinity plus one, which is written out here, and then I say, well, infinity plus one and infinity are the same, so I have infinity over here instead of infinity plus one, I now have an equation that involves just p infinity of x, and we can solve this set of equations to find the stationary distribution p infinity um, by solving this linear system. Yes? That's a great question. So is there a connection between eigenvectors and stationary distributions? And the answer is yes. So one way to see this, if you look at this equation over here, and this is beyond the scope of this class, so if you're not familiar with eigenvectors, don't worry about it, but if you are familiar with it, it's an interesting connection to see. What you see here is effectively, if you write out p infinity just as a vector, let's find some space, p infinity is a vector with multiple entries, let's say a column vector, then we have that p infinity equals the transition model p, which you can write out as a matrix, rows and columns, indices corresponding to where you're coming from, where you're going to, times p infinity. And so what we see here is that p infinity is an eigenvector of the transition model matrix p. There are many eigenvectors. It's the one that happens to eigenvalue, have the eigenvalue that's equal to uh, one. Um, and one way to find it is to effectively find these essentially um, using a standard eigenvector recovery algorithm, but a simple way to find it is to solve this set of equations here, just because we know exactly what we're trying to look for here.
we know that the eigenvalue is one, so you can right away solve this equation rather than having to iterate to then ultimately find out that the eigenvalue is one and now solve for the corresponding eigenvector. So here is our equation that we can use to recover the stationary distribution. So let's look at an example. Here is the weather example again. Let's look at how to recover the stationary distribution. This is that set of equations written out for the weather example. There are two possible values the state can take on. So there are two equations. Probability for being sunny at time infinity is equal to, and this is the standard mini forward algorithm update equation. Well, we go from infinity to infinity because we're at infinity and then we say that infinity plus one equals infinity. Same thing over here. We can fill in the numbers. We can simplify this. Turns out both of these equations are the same. In general, this will be true if you have a variable that can take on k values. Um, you'll actually get k equations, but there will be some redundancy there. And so you actually need one more equation to uniquely solve this. The extra equation you need is that the sum of the entries should be equal to one because we're looking for a probability distribution. So you use the stationary assumption equations as well as the equation for probability summing to one. Now you do have enough equations to recover the two unknowns or enough independent equations to recover the two unknowns and you can find the stationary distribution. All right, so this is the arithmetic. Yes, question? Yes, there will be, because of the properties of that matrix, the, essentially the, depends on how you set it up, but either the rows or the columns always will sum to one, and that effectively results in having some redundancy there. Um, essentially, another way to think of it is that the last equation, the equation for the last value is redundant because it's essentially saying all the probability that didn't already go to all the other values has to come to this last value. And so there's a redundant equation in there. And what we need to resolve that is this property that we know probabilities will sum to one. Okay, so let's look at two examples of Markov models. First example is one that you've actually been taking advantage of a lot throughout your lives. Um, it's underneath what Google uses to compute PageRank. So PageRank is a way to analyze the connectivity of the web graph. Um, the model you use here is one where you consider each web page, maybe state is not the perfect way to phrase it, each web page is a possible value the state can take on. The initial distribution is uniform over pages would be one way to set it up. And the transitions are that with some probability C, you uniformly jump to a random page. You could go anywhere on the web. Then with probability one minus C, you follow a random outlink on the page you are currently on. So this is something you could simulate. You could follow this random motion on the web where times you follow a random outlink, at other times you just randomly go somewhere on the web. Now you could do is you could analyze the stationary distribution of this Markov model. So what will the stationary distribution do? It will spend more time on highly reachable pages because you're more likely to jump into there. Um, for example, my many ways to get to the Acrobat reader download page because many people who post a PDF will say here's a way to find a way to read this PDF. Um, it's somewhat robust to link spam because it uniformly at random jumps out to any pages. To some extent makes it robust. There are other things you actually want to do in practice. Um, but this is effectively Google 1.0. If you had used Google in 98, um, what you'd have noticed is that there were many search engines out there at the time. Um, not called Google. These other search engines would effectively let you search for words and then somehow try to present you with the right web page based on whether that word appeared on those pages. Companies like Yahoo would actually have people 
browse the web and based on people browsing the web, tried to come up with a ranking for every possible word people might search for. You type in car, it might be like, well, let's browse the web and see which page we should show when somebody types in car and so forth. So it's pretty tedious, pretty difficult to do that right and keep that up to date. Um, the innovation that Larry Page and Sergey Brin came up with during their research and then later turned into Google um, is that rather than having people try to decide what page to show for a given keyword, use this algorithm to compute the stationary, dis com use this Markov model, compute the stationary distribution, and have the probability under the stationary distribution be the way you rank web pages that have the correct word appearing. And then show them based on that rank. Turned out that all of a sudden, um, you could find things on the web, whereas before it was near impossible to find the things you were looking for. Since then, Google has done a lot to further build on this, and we'll see when we cover machine learning, what are some things you can do to improve on this, especially once you are a popular search engine and people do visit your page, do a search, maybe among the top 10, don't always pick your top choice, but maybe pick something else that is giving you new information about how you might want to change your page rank. You might want to learn from that. And we'll see that a couple of lectures from now, how that works. But the initial version that effectively make Google the de facto search engine for everybody who was trying to find something back in 98 was this algorithm over here, just the random surfer model, computing the stationary distribution and using that as the page rank. It's another example of, an app of uh, where stationary distributions are very relevant. It's actually in the analysis of Gibbs sampling. So at the very last lectures on inference in base nets, we looked at this algorithm called Gibbs sampling. And I told you that if you run Gibbs sampling, and under some assumptions, which you'll now understand a little better, it relates to the fact that there has to be a stationary distribution to this process that you're going through. You're resampling a variable, resampling another variable. Keep repeating this, right? That's a random process where you can think of the values the state can take on in this process is every possible combined assignment to all variables is a possible state that you can be in. And so you transition from one set of assignments to another set of assignments, keep transitioning. And you can look at the stationary distribution of this process. And it turns out you can show that the stationary distribution of this process is the conditional distribution you are asked to sample from when you do Gibbs sampling. So this means that indeed, if you run this infinitely long, this Gibbs sampling procedure, you will end up with a sample from the stationary distribution. Star here means that this is well beyond the scope of 188. This is just kind of for your information. It's good to be aware of this. You might want to find out more about this at some point if you're really working with Gibbs sampling, but we're not going to quiz you in any way on any exam about how this really is the stationary distribution and how this all fits together. Any questions about Markov models? Then let's take a short break here. And after the break, we'll start looking at hidden Markov models. Let's uh, restart. Any questions that might have come up about Markov models? All right, then let's start looking at hidden Markov models. Um, what you see here is your essentially project five, Ghostbusters. Um, what's the premise there? Um, well, the premise is that you are now Gram Pack rather than Pac-Man itself. Um, Gram Pack is not afraid of the ghosts. Gram Pack takes them out, no problem. But Gram Pack is blind. And so if you were completely blind, can't see the ghosts, this is what it looks like to play this game. So you're trying to track down the ghosts. You got the blue one, the orange one, 
Now, aside from just being blind, Grandpa actually can hear a tiny little bit. You can hear the ghost rumbling. And so what you see at the bottom right there is some indication of the amount of noise Grandpa is hearing, which indicates how far away those ghosts might be. And so based on that information, I say, well, the cyan and the red slash orange ones seem pretty uh, far away. Let's move somewhere else. Oh, we're getting closer to one of them. There we got it. Um, trying to hear the other one. Trying to get closer to it somehow. Now we've got further away. And see, I'm trying to hope that you somehow find it. I'm looking at this number. Come on, where are you? Oh, got it. Okay, so that's the premise of the game, is that you hear some kind of noise indicating how far away the ghosts are. You can't see them. But you can take them out when you encounter them. So, think of this in terms of a robot kind of system as having a sonar. A sonar is a system where you send out sound waves. It's a little different, but it's almost the same thing. You send out sound waves, you see how it takes for them to come back to you, and so if the sound waves only bounce off a ghost, then you can see, well, how long did it take for that sound wave to come back to me? Um, all right, so now ideally what you would do is you would somehow cleverly combine all these measurements you get over time about distances to ghosts to come up with a reasonable estimate of where the ghost might be, rather than just looking at your latest measurement. And that's what hidden Markov models are about. It's about combining all the information you've collected so far into a current best estimate of what the distribution is over possible states. So in a hidden Markov model, rather than just having this top part here, which we had for a Markov model, we add evidence variables that hang off each of the state variables. So at each time, we get an observation. We don't typically get to observe the actual state. If we did, that'd make it a lot easier. We probably wouldn't be like, talking about it for a whole lecture. A lot of scenarios, you just get some noisy information about the state, but you do want to somehow accumulate that over time to get your best estimate. So here's our weather example again. But let's assume kind of a little bit of a um, bad scenario. Let's assume you are a grad student. Um, now, grad student life, what that means is you're sitting in a room with no um, access to the outside world doing your research. Um, and every now and then, your professor comes by, says hi to you, and sometimes your professor has an umbrella on them, sometimes they don't. And that's your way to get a feel for what the world is like outside. <laughs> All right? Not exactly as grim as I just described. Um, hopefully Chelsea can attest to that, but uh, <laughs> think of it that way for the purpose of this lecture, not for the purpose of your career. Um, so that's what this grad student's life is like. And so you're trying to infer whether it's raining or not, but you only get this noisy access to whether it might be raining or not. You have some model that if it's raining one day, it might likely rain the next day. Same for sun. And so we have an initial distribution here. We have a transition model, same as we had before. But then also we have an emission model or an observation model or a measurement model. Those are all equivalent. It's describing how the evidence relates to the current state. All right, so we have the dynamics model here, numerically into this table, and then we have the measurement model about whether you see an umbrella or not, given that it's raining or not. So that's one example of a hidden Markov model. Here's another example. Ghostbusters, we've looked at it, the grid where the ghost could be moving around in a circular motion. Initially, it might have a uniform distribution. Then usually the ghost might move clockwise but sometimes in the random direction or stay in place. Um, now, we might get measurements. We have this measurement model where if we measure at a certain location, we get some color information back, which relates to the distance to the ghost in a noisy way. And so let's look at that example again that we saw earlier. But let's look at it 
in the HMM context rather than the Markov model context. So if we think of it as an HMM, initially we have some initial state distribution. Then we get a measurement. Let's say the measurement was here. We get a new distribution as a consequence. We'll later see how to compute that. Then time elapses. The distribution will change according to the dynamics model. Then we get a measurement again. Time will elapse again. We get a measurement again. Time elapses again. We get a measurement again. Time elapses again, and so forth. And what you see here happening as this process evolves is that typically, when time elapses, the distribution will become more diffuse, spread out because of noise. And whenever we get a measurement, the distribution will peak a little more around certain locations because the measurement is giving us information about where the ghost might be. Now, this, the fact that it diffuses under the dynamics model, as we saw earlier, is not guaranteed. It depends on your dynamics model. You can have that whirlpool model where it actually concentrates in the middle, even without measurements. What is always going to be true is that when you get a measurement on expectation, this will reduce the uncertainty about the distribution, uh, about the state. And that will be reflected in a distribution that has effectively lower entropy. All right, so that's an HMM in action. What independence assumptions are we making in this type of model? So this is our model. So the assumption we're making here is that the current observation, let's say observation E4, current time, last time, is independent of everything else given the current state. So once we know x4, knowing anything about past observations, knowing anything about past states, doesn't tell us anything extra about E4. In fact, the same is true if anybody told you anything about the future. Once you have x4, that deseparates E4 from all the other variables in this graph. So it's a very specific assumption that we're making here is that this sensor functions in a way where it only depends on the current state in a direct way and only indirectly on other variables through that current state. It's an assumption, it's not guaranteed to be true. Um, in the Ghostbusters model where we're trying to find the ghost in the grid, that assumption is true, but we could imagine a sensor that's a little different where maybe once you measure a certain color at one time, it's a little more likely to get that same color again at the next time because a little bit of inertia in that sensor it doesn't change that quickly maybe. Now that assumption becomes violated unless you somehow put state information about the sensor into your state. Little quiz. Does this mean the evidence variables are guaranteed to be independent of each other? For example, is E2 independent of E3? Well, we know how to answer this type of question, right? To check if E2 is independent of E3, we check all paths between E2 and E3. There's only one path. Now, for that one path, we check whether it's an active path or an inactive path. Um, first triple is a common cause, middle node not observed, so active triple. The next triple is a causal chain, middle node not observed, so an active triple. All triples along the path are active, so the path is active. We found an active path between E2 and E3, which means we cannot guarantee their independence. Okay, so now of course, once you observe X2 or X3, E2 and E3 become independent. They are conditionally independent given X2 and also given X3. Okay, so the assumption we're making here effectively in a hidden Markov model is for the dynamics, what we had before, the next state is independent of all past states given the current state. And for the observations, the current observation is independent of everything else given the current state. What are some real HMM examples? Speech recognition can be tackled with HMMs. So the observations here would be acoustic signals. It would be continuous valid, so you'd have to do some work to deal with that, but 
There's no reason Bayes nets and HMMs wouldn't apply to continuous valued random variables. You just now have to deal with densities or discretize them, whatever you prefer. You can still go through the same kind of math. The states are specific positions in words. And then the sequence of states would correspond to a full word. Machine translation is often done with HMMs. What's the model here? Well, you could get, as your observation, a sequence of words in one language. The hidden state corresponds to the sequence of words in the other language. And so you can think of, for example, Russian as a noisy version of English. You run emphasis in your HMM, you get out the English version. Last one is robot tracking. So a typical scenario here would be that you have a robot, you want to track it. Um, an extreme example would be, let's say, you're trying to track a rocket that's going to the moon. Um, in fact, the first rocket that went to the moon was tracked using an HMM. Um, in fact, the first kind of pretty big application of HMM, so it wasn't called an HMM, it was called a Kalman filter, which is the name for an HMM with continuous variables that happen to be Gaussian distributed. So it's, just, it's really the same thing. It's an HMM, just happens to have continuous values, you can track a rocket while it's going to the moon and adjust how much each of your boosters is propelling the rocket to kind of steer it on the right path. Um, so what you have here is some observations that can relate to um, inertial measurements, maybe radar measurements and so forth, laser measurements if you have something on the real robot that's looking out, and then the state would be the position of the robot, maybe also the orientation on maybe some map or within space and you localize your robot by running inference in this HMM. Okay, so filtering or monitoring is the task of running a very specific type of inference. We've already seen how to run inference in general in a base net. We're now going to look at the very specific type of inference that actually we could do with just variable elimination, but it's a specific type of inference that's so relevant that we'll study it specifically in its own right. What we're trying to compute in filtering or monitoring is what we call a belief, BT of X, which is a shortcut notation or shorthand notation for the conditional distribution over the state of time T given evidence from time one through time T. So this first thing is just a shorthand notation. We introduce it because we'll need it so often. You would start with B1 of X, some initial setting, and then as time passes, and you get observations, you'd incorporate the effects of the dynamics on your estimate of the distribution and the effects of the observations on your estimate of distribution, and this would progress over time. Doing this calculation is called monitoring or filtering. So here's an example. Robot localization. Very simplified robot lo localization problem. What are the assumptions here? The robot can be asked to move in any of four directions. Well, it's asked to move into a wall, it'll stay in place. Um, there is some noise in its motion, so it doesn't always move in the direction it's asked to move into. It might stay in place. Um, it also has a measurement device. That measurement device functions as follows. In four directions, north, east, south, west, it can measure whether it's seeing a wall in that direction or not right next to its current grid square. So there are four binary measurements, wall or not wall. These measurements are noisy but not super noisy. At most, one of them can be a mistake. So for example, in the current location, that's shown with the red dot, it would measure, it would get four measurements back. The correct measurement, so to say, would be no wall to the east and west, and a wall north and south of the robot, but the actual measurement it receives could be one off from that. The gray here indicates how much probability mass is in each of the grid squares. So right now it's a uniform distribution. We are showing the robot with a red dot there because we happen to know running this demo where the robot really is. But if you're thinking in terms of the mindset of the robot, all you know is that there is this map, you're somewhere on this map and it's a uniform distribution over where you are. Now we'll see what happens as the robot moves and gets measurements. So here a measurement was obtained seeing a wall north and south, but not east or west. As a consequence, I'll go back to the previous one. So here was a uniform distribution after this measurement. We end up with this distribution over here. 
So darker is higher probability here in this visualization. And so wherever there are walls north and south, it's high probability. If there's only a wall north or only south, medium probability, if there is something that deviates even more from the measurement, probability might have gone to zero. Then the robot moves east, or at least attempts to move east. We'll see if it succeeds and gets another measurement. So the robot will move east, get a measurement, and here is now the new distribution. Again, we know where that red dot is located, where the robot is, but the robot just knows that distribution. That's the result of its filtering slash monitoring calculation. And so this proceeds over time. As we go along, this distribution gets more and more concentrated because of symmetry. There is really kind of equivalence here for now between the north corridor and the south corridor. But once it moves one more step, it resolves this asymmetry, and it has now almost all the probability mass in that one spot. Is it guaranteed to be there? No, it actually will never know. As long as the probability is not exactly equal to one, it will not know for sure where it is. But the probability might be pretty high at this point. It might be willing to act based on this distribution in some way, whatever it might need to do. OK, so that's the result of monitoring, what it would look like. Let's take a look at the base cases, the two things we really are computing underneath over and over and over. So one thing we're doing is we're incorporating evidence. Sometimes we start with a current distribution, or x1, and then we get evidence an observation E1, and we want to now know the distribution for X1 given E1. How do we do this? We actually know how to do this, right? Distribution for X1 given E1, that's a conditional distribution. We can write out the definition. We then know that since X1 is the only variable, E1 is fixed, it's assumed, observed, we only need to keep track of the factors that involve X1. So anything that doesn't involve x1 is constant across all possible values x1 can take on. And that's what we do over here. We say, let's instead of keeping track of the exact quantity, keep track of something that's proportional to what we want to compute. It's off by a constant, but keep in mind that constant is the same constant whether x1 takes on any of its values. So that's what this means here is that there is a fixed constant which we've been calling z, by how much we're off here. But that fixed constant is the same independent of which value x1 takes on. And we effectively will get rid of any term that in, doesn't involve x1, which in this case is this one over here. So now we just have to compute the join between x1 and e1. What are we given? The model we have has us with a prior distribution for x1. We have an observation model for e1 given x1. We can multiply that in. And here is the answer to what we're looking for. We'll compute this for all possible values of x1. This will give us a vector with a unnormalized distribution for x1 given e1. And then we'll compute the sum of all those entries. That gives us the normalization constant. We'll divide all entries by that normalization constant. And we'll have the conditional distribution for x1 given e1. So that's one base case. The other base case is when time elapses. So we're interested in distribution for x2, but we currently only have the distribution for x1, but we also have a transition model that describes how the dynamics behaves. So we know something about x1 and x2. So how do we bring in x1? We can always write the marginal over one variable as a sum over another variable of the join between this variable x2 and that other variable x1. So we can write it out this way over here. This is always true. Then we fill in the quantities that we have available to ourselves, which is the marginal for x1, which is our current belief before the dynamics update happened. And then we have a conditional for x2 given x1, which was available to us when somebody gave us the model or when we built the model ourselves. And so what we get out of this calculation here is the probability for x2 taking on a particular value, we do that for all values x2 can take on, and there is our distribution for the next time. These are the base cases. So this is assuming our base net looks as simple as what we have here or here. But this is effectively what we're going to do when we run filtering, except that we're going to be carrying around an additional condition on some more evidence variables in the back everywhere in this calculation. That's going to be the only difference. 
And we know we can always do that, right? We know that whenever we have some calculation that works out, we can condition on additional things consistently everywhere, and that same calculation will still hold true. So that's what we're doing in the next couple of slides. We're going to generalize both of these to account for all past evidence as we do the calculation. So passage of time is the first one. We're interested in the belief or at each time for our state xt, which is the conditional for xt given the evidence from time one through time t. So this one through t or e1 through t, what that stands for is e1, e2, e3, and so forth all the way till et. So after one time step passes, what do we get? We do the same calculation, but we just have extra stuff here. But remember what we did on the previous slide. We said to get something about x2, if we only have something about x1, we can write this as a sum over x1 of the joint between x1 and x2. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll write it as a joint over xt and xt plus 1 and sum out xt. Sure, we're carrying around a little extra baggage in the back here, but that's fine. Um, now, we need to use the quantities we have available to ourselves. We have available to ourselves the conditional for xt plus 1 given t, and we have the current belief for xt given all evidence so far. So we do the exact same breakdown, just like we did on the previous slide. If you ignore e1 through t, and you set t equal to 1, you get exactly the same equation as on the previous slide. Now, let's see. This thing over here is not something we have available when somebody gives us the model. But remember, our assumption is that the distribution over xt plus 1, given xt, is independent of everything in the past. So this conditioning here can be totally gotten rid of. It'll still be the same. And so we get rid of that. And now we have an expression that we do have all the quantities for. And this is our passage of time update when we do monitoring. So just as a reminder, the only place where we use an assumption is to go from here to here. So just to recap, the first step here, you can always do for any distribution over some set of variables. You can introduce an extra variable before the conditioning bar and sum over that extra variable. That's always okay to do. All right, so this is always okay. The next step, what we're doing there is we're saying that a joint distribution is a product, it's essentially applying the product rule here. We have a joint between x2 plus, xt plus 1 and xt, given some stuff in the back. We apply the product rule as xt plus 1 given xt and xt and carrying around all that stuff in the back. So the product rule with extra stuff in the back everywhere, always a valid thing to do. Then here, is where we apply an assumption we made about our distribution. We assume that the state at time t plus 1 is independent of everything in the past once we know the state at time t. And so we got rid of this stuff over here. And that gives us the final equation. Okay. More compactly, we might write this as follows. Some new notation here. It's saying b prime xt plus 1. What is b prime xt plus 1? b prime xt plus 1 is the probability distribution for xt plus 1, given the evidence from 1 through t. If we got rid of that little prime at the top here, we'd have to add a t plus 1 in the evidence. But So notice what's different here. We have a t plus 1 here and a t here that's mismatched by 1. That's what this prime here is indicating at the top of the b. So it's the belief we get after just applying the dynamics update but haven't observed the next evidence yet. And this is our equation. Okay, so we pushed the belief through the transition model. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is as we write out beliefs, um, keep in mind what this notation means. We're actually not explicit here anymore about the evidence, but the reason we know E1 through T is there is because we wrote a capital B. All right, it's not okay to write pxt. That doesn't mean the same as bxt. That's something different. That's just a marginal for xt. When we write bxt, it means we condition everything, all our evidence variables, up to time t. So what does this look like in this 
small Ghostbusters grid. As time passes, you'll see this uncertainty accumulate. We've seen this in action, of course. Ultimately, you might get too much uncertainty. We need our measurement updates. So how does that play out? Remember that slide we looked at with the very basic measurement update with just these two nodes? We'll use the exact same math we used there, except that we'll carry around extra junk in the back and we'll call our index T rather than the number one. Actually, we'll call the index T plus one in this particular case, the way it's set up, I think. So after evidence comes in, so we're at time T plus one, our new evidence has come in. We're in conditioning on also ET plus one. So this is just a definition of conditional probability. The conditional for XT plus one, given some evidence, is the joint between XT plus one and ET plus one divided by the probability of ET plus one. And we everywhere condition on the same stuff. That's just always assumed observed. All right, then we do the same thing as we did before. What are we doing here? We're saying that we're interested in a distribution over the variable xt plus one. xt plus one is the only variable in our distribution. That means that we can get rid of any factors that don't involve xt plus one. This one here does not involve xt plus one, so we can get rid of it. Now, of course, what we'll get out is not a distribution anymore that sums to one, it'll sum to something different. And at the end, we'll have to see what it sums to and renormalize, okay? But for now, we can get rid of it and then we can compensate for it later when we do the renormalization step. That's what this thing here means. It's saying that we only have one variable xt plus one and the result we're computing will be such that we need to effectively scale every entry in our vector, our vector with one value for each value xt plus one can take on rescale it by some constant factor. Now what we do is we apply the um, rule of uh, the product rule. So what is, what is happening here? We're si again, try to ignore this part for now. Ignoring that part, you see this is just a product rule between two variables, but we know that we can always carry around extra stuff as long as we do it consistently. And so we do carry it around because we need it. Okay, so this was product rule. Next step, we apply our conditional independence assumption. For the HMM, we assume that the evidence at time t plus one is independent of all past evidence given the state at time t plus one. And so over here, we can drop that out. This is our HMM assumption. Well, one of the assumptions, another one related to the dynamics, this is the one related to the evidence. At this point, what do we have? We have this quantity over here, which is something we're given as part of the HMM. This quantity over here, that's B prime. That's our B prime XT plus one. We have that from the previous step in our calculation. So at this point, we have quantities we have available to ourselves. We can compute the answer. We can write this out more compactly as follows. Now keep in mind, you'll do this calculation for every value xt plus one can take on. This will give you a vector. That vector will not sum to one. You will then compute the sum of all entries and use that to normalize the vector and make it sum to one. All right, so what you see happening here intuitively is that this factor here, what it does, it reweights entries in your original belief by how likely the evidence is assuming that we're the state. So it's a lot like likelihood weighting. It's just in this case, we actually do an exact calculation. We weight things and then we renormalize to get the exact distribution out. Okay, so if we were to run inference in our Ghostbuster grid world, um, what would happen is as we get a measurement, the distribution would concentrate more around certain squares. Here's our weather HMM and an example calculation of how this plays out. We start with an initial belief. Don't know whether it's raining or not. The grad student sitting in your office. Um, the next time, next day, you have the same distribution, just the way the math works out because it's 
is set up, happens to be set up that way, that it's equally likely to be rainy or sunny after it's been rainy or sunny the previous day. Then your professor comes by, um, based on them coming by and having an umbrella, you update the probability and you now have a higher probability that it's raining. Then time passes again, you get a new distribution, professor comes by again, um, you're again carrying an umbrella, so again, um, your probability of rain goes up and so forth. So that's the specific calculation assuming these were the values in your HMM. So now we know how to do inference in an HMM. We're going to, the next slide, again cover how to do inference in an HMM in a way that gets the same result but essentially collapses the time update and the measurement update in one calculation. The reason to do this is just that some people do it this way and it's good for you to know both ways of going about this. The other reason to do it is that it'll actually be equivalent to what happens when you do variable elimination, which is something you already know and that way you see the connection between the two. So here is what we're interested in. We're interested in starting from a current distribution, our current belief, go to the next time incorporating dynamics and observations. So here we'll actually do a calculation that's recursive going back. So we're interested in distribution for time t, given evidence up to time t. We're going to calculate it as a function of distribution of time t minus one, okay? So we can say first that this conditional is proportional to the joint between all these variables. That's always true. X is the only variable here. So at the end, we'll look at all entries sum together and renormalize based on that. Now, what we see here is that we use the same property we've been using so far for dynamics to incorporate another state variable. You just put it in front of the conditioning bar with everything else and sum over it. You can always do that. Then here we use the product rule again multiple times to split this up. So we're saying the joint here is equal to, um, we start with this part here, effectively the chain rule, the way we apply it multiple times. It's we first take most of the variables, and then the product rule would say, and now we need to multiply with the conditional of the other variables, given the variables we already picked, and that's what this is over here. This is effectively distribution for xt and et, given the variables we already picked, xt minus one and e1 through t minus one. But we did some extra work on it already. We said, well, on that quantity, we can apply Again, the product rule, we can make it xt given xt minus one, e1 through t minus one, times et given xt, xt minus one, and e1 through t minus one. Then we can simplify using the HMM assumptions, xt given xt minus one and past evidence. Don't need a past evidence here. et given xt and past state and evidence don't need this past stuff here. That's our HMM assumption for measurements. Once we fill that in, we get these quantities over here. Now, everything that appears there effectively is available to us from the calculation we're doing, right? We can reorganize this a little bit, but we now effectively have an update equation that tells us what the join between the current state and all evidence up to that time is as a function of the join between the past state and evidence up to the past time, and then some quantities that are given to us when we're given the HMM. This computes effectively the same thing. It's a join, but you can renormalize to get the conditional. And so we have a new way of computing our belief at time t, then go to t plus one and so forth. This here is exactly what you'd get if you run variable elimination. If you run variable elimination in your HMM, you first eliminate x1, then eliminate x2, then x3, and keep going that way, you're effectively running the forward algorithm, exactly the same calculation. Okay, so to do online belief updates as we go along, effectively what we do is we do an update for time and an update for evidence, or we do them both at once using the forward algorithm. Either way is fine. Um, the forward algorithm doesn't necessarily normalize um, in practice, normalization can be important. The reason it can be important to do it as you go along is that your numbers will get smaller and smaller and smaller otherwise. 
And so if you naively run the forward algorithm, just computing the joint between the current state and all past evidence, those numbers will get closer and closer to zero. At some point on your computer, they will actually be zero. You'll have nothing left. So let's see what happens if we look at your project five again, but now we run the forward algorithm or time update followed by measurement update. And we'll now have some AI play the game rather than me. Remember the setting? You get some noisy measurement of where the ghost might be based on your sonar. Those numbers show up at the bottom right. It was very hard to track down the ghost just looking at those current instantaneous measurements. But now we're, we'll run a filtering algorithm and you'll see a probability distribution visualized for each of the ghosts. And then some search algorithm will guide Pac-Man to try to track down this ghost. Here we go, tracking down the blue one, got it. And now red one. Um, not that easy to track down apparently this time. There it is. Tracking down this one. Important to see here, as Pac-Man gets closer and gets more and more measurements about that ghost, the distribution as time passes will collapse with the measurement, will expand again as the ghost has a move that it makes, and this repeats over time. In this case, you see that there, in some sense, the distributions are roughly of the same size, so to say, over time. What that means is that, in some sense, the measurements and the noise are roughly canceling each other out, and you get in some kind of regime where there is some uncertainty left because your measurements are not enough to fully nail where the ghost is because there is noise again at the next time step. But you get a reasonable distribution good enough to track it down ultimately. Okay, so this was um, hidden mark of models in this scenario where we have small state spaces, meaning that the number of values we can have at each time for the state is relatively small. We can actually enumerate all of them in a big vector. Remember when we solved market decision processes, at some point we transitioned to state spaces that were too large to have a tabular Q value representation? So next lecture we'll deal with the same kind of issues for tracking and monitoring where we look at how to do inference in HMMs when the state space is too large to do it exactly the way we saw it today.